the circumcision of his son, John the Baptist. Then John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child, John, grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The prophets, including the prophet Isaiah, had proclaimed the advent or the coming of one who would prepare the way for God's Savior, the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah said, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. John the Baptist was that messenger. His was the voice he emerged from the desert, crying, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his way straight. God had promised from the very beginning, even as he was sending Adam and Eve out from the garden, God had promised a Savior that one day the seed of the woman would prevail over the seed of the serpent, that Messiah would crush sin and be victorious even over death. And after centuries, centuries and centuries of waiting, one day finally came. John the Baptist, who was the last and the greatest of the prophets, stood on the threshold between old and new, opened the door for Jesus to walk through. John saying, this is the way. This is the one. Repent. Repent and receive forgiveness for sins. Be at peace with God. Now the locust eating, camel hair wearing baptizer was something of an edgy choice for God the prophet of peace. John did not hesitate to confront people in their sins or to call out their hypocrisy or to condemn their corruption. John was happy to stir the pot and to turn things upside down. Whatever people were expecting of the messenger who would make the way for Messiah, John probably wasn't it. But then Jesus, Jesus wasn't the Messiah that the people were expecting either. Jesus himself was all about stirring up the pot and turning things upside down, ushered in a new 
realm, God's kingdom of heaven, where the low are lifted up and the proud and the mighty are sent away hungry. Jesus, who brought a new way, a way in which the poor and the meek and the hungry and those who thirsted for righteousness and those who were merciful and those who mourned, those who were pure in heart and the peacemakers and the persecuted, well, they are the lucky ones. They're the blessed and fortunate ones in God's kingdom. Jesus, the Messiah, born in a lowly manger, a Savior come to conquer, not as a king, but as a suffering servant. Jesus, who was the embodiment, the enfleshment of the living God who emptied himself of all the divine prerogatives so that he could be as us, to live with us and to be for us. John the Baptist, this unexpected prophet of peace, was born into a kind of peace, at least quiet. Father Zechariah was rendered mute by the angel Gabriel when Zechariah pushed back on Gabriel's announcement that Zechariah's wife Elizabeth, who had been barren, was going to conceive a child in her old age. And Zechariah said, compare Mary, who said, let it be according to your word. Well, Zechariah remained mute for the entire pregnancy plus two days. But what's lesser known is that Elizabeth hid herself away for the duration as well. It was very quiet in that household. Except for the time that Elizabeth's relative Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to visit and sang the song of salvation. And the Holy Spirit caused the baby in Elizabeth's home, Gee, that was John the Baptist, to quicken the leaf in her womb. So John was born in peace, and he lived in peace. Our last verse today that John remained in the wilderness until the day that he publicly appeared to Israel. Our text is silent as to when it was that Zechariah and Elizabeth delivered John into the wilderness. We hope it wasn't as an infant and just left him there. But the age of majority for a man in that day was 13. He said, even if you add a few extra years, it's possible that John lived a substantial portion of his life in solitude, in the desert. His ministry did not begin until shortly before Jesus at age 30. So John was born into peace, he lived in peace, and he cultivated relationships that were founded in peace. John humbled himself so that the light could shine on Jesus. He was making the way for Jesus, not for himself. He deferred to Jesus as, I should be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. He pointed his own followers to Jesus and said, go be his disciples. He's the one that you are looking for. We compare here our own relationships that are not founded on peace. All of them, if we're honest, marked in some way by some level of conflict because we're selfish, self-centered, we're self-sufficient, we fight to get what we have and we fight to hang on to it, even in our most intimate relationships. Love is a battlefield, right? And that's because of our sin and our brokenness. We are at odds with God and with one another. 
and we're unable to make things right. Can't do it on our own. John Gordon did these, lived in these cultivating relationships that are founded, based on peace, and he proclaimed the way of peace. The risen Christ stood among his followers and said, Peace be with you. John the Baptist had prepared the way for those followers to receive that peace. Now, Zachariah, his father, when he regained his voice after John's birth, filled with the hope that accompanies new life, sang about God's faithfulness to all generations, but also about his own son's future and the call that God had on John's life. Zechariah says, you, my son, my child, you were born to give knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins, which is the way of peace. God's peace flows from the reconciliation with God, the restoration of right relationships with God and with one another. God's peace is a gift. It's a gift for those who kneel in faith before God and who live according to his Word. That peace is for us even today. God's word for us and it's God's peace for us. If, if we will respond to that word, respond to that call to repent. Because it's not enough for us to think, as we often do, that, well, Jesus is my friend, my buddy, or he was a good teacher, a lot of cool things. He was a good guy who helped a lot of people back then. We have to make him Lord and Savior, make him boss of our lives, to put the control in him. Repentance requires that we take an honest and unflinching look back. Who we are, what we've been, what we've done, what's been done to us, that we confess our sins and our brokenness, and that we be willing to take up our cross and follow on the walk of faith. That should be a no-brainer. It should be an easy choice for us. Why? Because the promise of forgiveness is sure and it is certain. The hymn that we will sing after the sermon, To my people now proclaim that my promise waits for them Tell them that their sins I cover and their warfare now is over. Comfort, comfort now, my people. That's good news. That's the good news. That's the good news. And yet we all know people who are at war with God. We don't know that their warfare now is over. People opposed to God's will in their lives, maybe some of us here today, people who have been fighting, going our own way for years, maybe a whole lifetime, never knowing the peace that is promised to us. And we all struggle. Even after we have come to Christ, as lifelong believers, we all struggle. We draw 
all of those value lines and say, this you can have in my life, God. But not this stuff. This is, I'm going to still be in control over here in this part of my life. We are deeply committed to making our lives work apart from God's will. It goes to the heart of the human condition. We're good at that. We project our fears and our frailties and our foolishness onto God. We blame God, get angry at God for failing us or doing to us or not doing for us, and we deceive ourselves. By thinking we don't need God. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to do that. To wrestle with God. And sometimes we get injured, like Jacob. And we walk with a permanent limp afterwards. That book is indeed filled with stories. We have fought God and lost and won. And won. When they have given over that control to God. A number of years ago, driving with my kids and one extra friend in the car, or we were driving in our hometown in May, Washington. We had just gone past the post office, stopped behind the line of traffic, we went down the behind us, and the minivan did not realize the traffic had stopped and rear ended us going somewhere around 35 miles an hour. The kids referred to that as the boom bang. <laughs> the boom bang. Daddy, we were a boom bang today. Thankfully, no one hurt. The boom referred to the boom that we got hit from behind. The bang was being driven up underneath the doorway in front of us. Went to retrieve one item from the wrecked car at the junkyard. It was my application for seminary, <laughs> which was still in the envelope, with the dress and ready to deliver for some time. It had been in the trunk. Got the crowbar, opened up the trunk, retrieved the application. That's an acronym in front of the post office. Perhaps we should stop by the post office on the way from home. We did and mailed the application. Stop hiding. Do peace instead. Do peace with God instead. God loves us. Loves you. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for our lives. Take the free gift of grace and submit to God's plan. There is no greater reward than resting in God's perfect peace. No matter what is going on in the world out there, as important as it is and as important it is for us to engage in it, we have the assurance that we follow the Prince of Peace who is our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Whatever is going on in our lives, the concerns that we have, the grief that we carry, the burdens that we need others to share the load of whatever suffering, anxiety we have. We also have the peace that passes all understanding. As we look forward to celebrating yet again Christmas Eve, we think about the stillness of that night, and we sing about the silence of that night. We gather with family and our family of faith. That peace is for us as well. When the first Christmas morning was dawn, the tender mercy of our God broke into the darkness of this world. 
That light that shines in the darkness, it still shines for us today. It's, it's a light that the darkness cannot overcome. By the tender mercy of our God, Zechariah sang, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet 